So the theme of this video is getting started recording your saxophone. The fact of the matter is that you don't have to spend a ton of money to get a really good result. I'd like to avoid some of the pitfalls that I've seen people falling into, such as buying gear that doesn't really have an established reputation or track record, which may be good rather than going that route. For my recommendations, I'm going to stick with brands and products that are very established, starting with which you can see here, I'm gonna angle the camera because I'm a super professional and I can do that. This um, SM57 microphone here. Okay, this is an industry standard. It is very uh, robust, famously robust microphone. And in fact, even in some top studios, and actually, no, let me correct that. Every single top studio and every single mediocre studio and everybody in between and also every stage at a professional level and most amateur levels has either one or a ton of these microphones because they are the standard. They're just good. They're fine. They do the, the job. Sometimes they're the best thing for the source. Sometimes they're just good enough. But either way, if you want to get started, you get it brand new for like a hundred bucks. I got this one on reverb for maybe 80. These things are excellent. You just want to have one around. The other thing that I'm gonna recommend is right now, this is 2023. And for many years now, the standard for, for beginners starting out is usually the Focusrite Scarlet series. It's cheap interfaces that do a good job. And the interface is the device that you need in order to connect your microphone, which is an acoustic signal, it's powered, might not be powered by vibrations of the air, but in this case it is, but it's it's sending an acoustic signal through a wire and it has to get into your computer somehow. The interface is what you use to do that. That's it, that's what you need, a mic and an interface and, and of course a cable, an XLR cable or mic cable as they're called. Um, that's what you need. <laughs> Oh, one more thing you might want is a pair of headphones. They don't have to be super great. Uh, they should be comfortable. You want closed back headphones because you don't want the sound that's going to your ears to be bleeding out into the room and into your microphone. And it's just very helpful. In fact, right now I can hear myself in my headphones and it gives me a better idea what I sound like on the microphone. I've been pretty careful about staying still. With the headphones on, it would be a really Good reminder not to do something like this, where you can hear my voice getting farther away from the mic and, and a lot less clear. Yeah, headphones are good. We've got our gear. Let's get connected. Okay, so now it's time to connect the Scarlet to the mic and then over to the computer. Um, never mind my messy studio. And I'm trying to get in here with one hand. Sorry for the vertical video. That is the lock. That's for a little desktop lock. You don't plug anything in there other than the lock. And then there is the USB slot. So now that we're hooked up, we need to connect the XLR cable to the microphone and the microphone to the Scarlet. So there's only one way it can go. It's not it's not hard to do. You just uh, plug it into the mic, this, the end of the cable that goes, and then the end of the cable that goes into this slot here. There are three little holes, and you can see them in that little triangular formation. And you just want to line up the three little rods in there with those three little holes and plug into channel one. So now we're gonna talk about mic placement. You might be tempted to just jam the microphone down into the bell of your horn. It's not gonna sound super great. And there are a few reasons for that. For one, this kind of microphone, uh, a cardioid microphone, has a pretty strong reaction to proximity, getting closer to the source. When it's really close, this proximity effect exaggerates some of the lower frequencies. Now you might think, okay, this is a, a really natural sounding thing, right? You get close to a mic, it's gonna get louder, right? And, Absolutely, it will. But it changes the the quality of the tone as well. At the basic level, you just want to avoid it. 
So you don't want to be super up in the bell. You also want to control how loud or soft your instrument is going through your microphone. And the way we do that with the Focusrite Scarlett is um, using this little knob that is right next to the XLR cable on channel one. This is a gain knob. Gain just means how strong the signal is piping through here. Your microphone is now connected to the interface. Part of the interface is a preamp, which is just um, a device that amplifies the signal. Okay, it's what it says on the box, right? Using this knob, you can turn it up, you can turn it down. You wanna turn it up until your level is good. What is good? Well, for this, we're going to look to our recording software. On my screen here, we can see this little section here, the channel strip section, has a display that represents how loud I am as I'm speaking into this channel, the level meter, okay? Uh, it also has this little display here, which shows the peak level that I have hit at any point. For the most part, we want, you know, your actual content peaks to be somewhere around minus 12 dB. You can push it up to minus nine. If you're very consistent, you might even go a little higher. You generally want it to be as high as you can consistently get, but you never want to run the risk of going over zero. This is the area where most people fail as they're starting their recording process. You turn up to what sounds like a great volume and then you get really excited while you're playing or you get close to the mic or you stop paying uh, attention. You, whatever might happen, your peak goes over zero, okay? These are negative values here. Zero is as loud as it can be. A, a lower negative value means a quieter signal. So like minus infinity is, the, is no no volume, right? Minus 12 is about where you want it to be to be safe and not really have to worry. And the reason that we avoid this is that when you get to that zero, we get this phenomenon called clipping, which is what you get when, if you imagine one of those um, graphical representations of your sound wave, you know, the little squiggles, um, if the top or the bottom of those squiggles were higher or lower, than the, um, than the room that you have for them, then those tops and bottoms would get cut off, clipped off, clipped. And they would just be flat instead of the shape that they're supposed to be. And this gives us the sound of clipping, which is a really terrible sound. I won't play an example. I'm sure you can hear plenty. Um, or you can experiment with your own microphone to hear the sound of a clipped signal. But it's it's an awful sound and it will ruin your recording, okay? Let's look at the other controls real quickly because there are some cool controls here on the front of this Scarlet that are worth talking about. Okay, we have the Inst button. This is going to change the signal level from mic level to instrument level. And that's if you're using a guitar. You want that off when you're using your microphone. There's another button next to it called Air. The air button is imitating a circuit on some of Focusrite's more expensive gear, which just brightens up the signal a little bit. Um, it adds more high frequency stuff. We have a 48 volt button is also known as phantom power. And we use phantom power to run certain kinds of microphones, condenser microphones that require a little bit of electricity to be sent to them to work. If you're using an SM57, like I recommended at the beginning of this video, you won't need that. We have a direct monitoring button. The direct monitoring button enables direct monitoring. What's that? Well, direct monitoring is a really cool feature, actually. What it means is you get to hear exactly what's going into the microphone before it goes through the software on your computer. Why is that a big deal? Well, the software on your computer is going to introduce what we call latency, which means that when you hear it play back at you, there's a slight delay, which can be extremely unsettling. So if you push the button once, you're gonna see the little green uh, circle light up. That one green circle means that it's monitoring you in mono. Monophonic sound means that whatever you're hearing through this one channel here is going to come back equally into both ears which if you're using headphones and you're monitoring in stereo uh and you're only using one microphone in channel one it's only going to come through the left ear channel two it's only going to come through the right ear and again super unsettling very unnatural sound because in nature if you hear somebody speaking to you from your right you actually still hear some of that in your left ear you want to monitor yourself in mono this is just for monitoring it won't affect what's going into your computer the final control on this unit is the big monitoring knob 
next to the headphone jack and this does not control the headphone level at all. This only controls the level of the outputs on the back of the unit. So if you have your Scarlett connected to some speakers, the big knob is gonna control the level going to the speakers. And you want that level to be down, unless your speakers are off. Just for peace of mind, you might just wanna turn it down regardless uh, while you're recording. Because any sound coming through those speakers is going to bleed into your microphone and it's gonna mess with the quality of your recording. That brings us to the next idea, um, the acoustic environment that you're in. You can see to my left, I have these little blinky lights. They're on an acoustic absorption panel. It's six inches thick. And my studio here is covered with them. You don't need a whole ton of acoustic treatment to get a decent recording. The most important thing is that your room is quiet and that your room is not very live sounding or wet sounding. So if you clap your hands, you don't wanna have a whole huge ringing reverberation in the room. So a good way to manage that is, you know, if you have a bunch of clothes in the room, some bookshelves, um, a bed, carpet, curtains, thick curtains, the classic DIY solutions for these things are like moving blankets that you can hang up in various places. So if you're finding that the simpler DIY solutions are not really cutting it, they also sell kind of uh, acoustic absorbers that can bolt onto a mic stand. They actually do a decent job, at least the one that I have. Uh, I've used it in the past. I don't need it here, but if I were going to do like a recording in my living room for some reason or a different room in the house, I probably would bust it out and try and use it. It's very easy to go into, you know, kind of a lot of uh, effort and depth with your acoustic treatment if your goal is to build a proper studio of any kind, but just to record your saxophone, you won't need it. You know, just a limited amount, right? And you can gauge that pretty much by ear. Also, certain microphones are a lot more sensitive to room sound and your SM57, if that's what you're using, is not super sensitive to that. Is it gonna have an effect on what the, what sound goes through the mic? Yeah, absolutely. Your room is definitely gonna have an effect, but it could be worse. Everybody knows that in the modern era, we record with our computers and we use software to do that. What software? Well, that software is called a DAW or D-A-W stands for Digital Audio Workstation. And this is just the platform that we use to record ourselves. It gives us a display like you see right now where you have a left to right visual representation of what you're recording. And then you might have a top down representation of the different separate tracks. There are a lot of different DAWs to choose from. A very popular option for Mac users, of course, is GarageBand because it comes free with your computer. Also, it's free with your iPad. If you learn how to connect your Scarlett to your iPad, which you can do, you can use GarageBand for free. And there are plenty of other platforms. Most of them can work on a PC or Mac. Some of them work on Linux. There's just a ton of them. Um, Pro Tools, Logic, Reason, Digital Performer, Luna, Bitwig, Ableton Live, Cubase, or any of the uh, Nuendo stuff, Reaper. There are just a ton to choose from. And unfortunately, they all have a little bit of a different visual thing going on. So I can't tell you how everything works on every DAW, but there are some universal ideas that if you know what you're looking for, you should be able to find. Like your mute button, your solo button, your record enable button. Those are all things that you should be able to find in any DAW. And on the screen in front of you right now, you see the yellow S lit up. That stands for solo. That means that this track that's highlighted, the one that has that yellow S, that's the track that is soloed. So if I were to push play on this right on this pre-recorded screen right now, I would only hear that track and not the other track above it that should play at the same time. So if you're going to record your saxophone over a backing track, you want to have your saxophone on one track and you want to record enable that track by pressing the little R and then you'll play along with the backing track which you load onto another track. You drag that file over from your desktop and it'll automatically load into the track here. It'll be a stereo track, unlike your saxophone, which should be a mono track. Like earlier, we talked about input monitoring being weird if it's in stereo, only coming in one ear. Same idea with your tracking. So 
here in Logic, this vertical section here on the left is a channel strip. And this is like a little more detailed representation of what you see in the horizontal little header section over here. There's this circle right next to the name of the input. On yours, it should say input one, because that's where you want to record your Scarlet channel one. And to the left of that, there's a circle. That means that this track for me is already set up in mono, which is something I did when I loaded this, uh, this audio onto this channel. But if it has two circles overlapping, the same symbol that you see on the, on the input monitoring section of the front of your Scarlet, then you want to click it and select the one circle to make it mono. The other track, the one that you're using for your background music that you want to record over, that one you want it to be in stereo. You want to have the two overlapping circles. We plug in the Scarlet and what happens? On my DAW, I get a, a little notification asking me if I want to use it and I can choose to use it. I can click on use. It will just automatically set up my software to use that, but you should learn how to navigate the menus and find it yourself. And I'm going to show you how to do this in logic because there are some universal things that all DAWs kind of need to provide for you. So as long as you understand the idea of what I'm doing here, you should be able to find a way to do it within your own DAW. I'm going to go up here to the logic pro menu. And I'm selecting settings and from settings, I'm going to go to audio because that's what we're dealing with here. And I'm making sure that for both my output device and my input device, I'm selecting the Scarlet 2i2 USB because that's the device that we want to use. And once the, those are both um, selected, it's time to hit apply. And you see, um, I actually neglected to get the output device selected here because I'm just using input monitoring while I'm recording this video and I didn't think it was important to listen back. Over here, I wanted to select 48 kilohertz as my sample rate because that's the standard sample rate that most of the industry works in. But this is a old template that I'm using and I neglected to do that when I started the project, which means I have a lot of editing to do when it comes to syncing my audio with my video. Next, I am selecting low latency monitoring. Now I have a little special icon for it, the way I have my DAW set up um, that lights up orange there, but I can always go to my menu and find low latency monitoring mode. This is an important thing to have because when you record your audio, your system's gonna cause some latency, meaning that the audio that you record is actually gonna, it's gonna print later than when you actually played it. And it can be very annoying to try and line it up, especially if your rhythm isn't perfect. So the checklist, before you hit record, make sure you have your backing track on the right track. Make sure it's a stereo track. Make sure you have your recording track set up for your saxophone. You've selected the input, input one. You've set your level on your Scarlet using the input gain knob. You have your headphones plugged into the Scarlet so you can hear what is playing in your DAW and you have direct monitoring selected on the Scarlet so you can hear what you play without any delay. By the way, you don't want to be monitoring yourself in the DAW while you're recording if you have direct monitoring enabled. If you have both of them, the interplay between the direct signal that happens right as soon as you play and the lagging signal that comes from your DAW is gonna make it sound really weird in your headphones and it might be kind of disorienting. Once everything is set up, your saxophone track has record enabled, your R is lit up, then you can reach up for that round record button up there or push R on your keyboard, depending on how your system is set up and get to recording.